Thank you for coming in. Now, in my book, In Praise of Aging, I describe a revolution which is underway. Life expectancy has increased by 30 years in the 20th century, and by 2050, we can expect to live beyond 90. 14% of our population of 23 million are now over 65. And by the end of the 21st century, 25% of Australians will be older than 65. So they will demand, and some of you will be part of it, respect and opportunities to work and participate in society with appropriate care at the end of our lives. But right now, our political leaders are making the wrong decisions. We talk a lot about ageing, but our definitions are all over the place. You can't develop policy and programs for people when we don't know who those people are and what they're really like. Now, medically, old age sets in before 50. When my husband, Dom, was taken to hospital some years ago, having jumped a fence and smashed his foot, taken by ambulance, he heard a nurse say, we've got an old one out there. <laughs> now, Dom was 44 at that stage. Newspaper reports commonly refer to 60-year-olds as elderly when they might have 30 years ahead of them. So when is somebody old? Is 50 the magic number? Is 70 the new 60? Are we old when we qualify for a seniors card? When we retire from the workforce? When we qualify for the pension? When we access our superannuation? when we have grandchildren? The answers have very different policy implications. We have no agreement about when a person is old, but the word is loose, used loosely and pejoratively very early on. When, once we're so defined, we're often patronised, ignored, even shouted at. Do you remember Bob Hawke's repost to that 74-year-old who challenged him on the campaign trail in Wyala? You silly old bugger, he said. We should treat old age as a natural stage of life which has particular needs and diverse people. As we do the stages of childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and our working years. At each stage, the state provides essential services and does not scapegoat the recipients. Another day in the life of an elder is as worthwhile as a day in the life of a young adult. Yet our current policies and attitudes do not reflect this premise. Treasury, successive governments and the Productivity Commission carry on about the ageing population and the dependency ratio, insisting that the old are going to squeeze the life out of the younger workers. But they're measuring the wrong things. Treasury uses an arbitrary definition of the dependency ratio, and that is the number of non-working dependents as a proportion of the number of productive workers. It's a flawed formula of infinite flexibility depending on the assumptions that you build into it. For example, a lower birth rate means fewer dependent children and youth, lower costs for maternity hospitals, childcare benefits and schools. An increase in productivity through advanced technology or improved management systems of a mere 0.5% would cover the costs of aged care and aged health expansion. 
And what is dependency anyway, when we know that the flows of both financial assistance and moral support run from old to young much more than from young to old? And what even is productivity when the GDP fails to measure the significant dollar value of caring work, voluntary work, community work and creative work without which our economy could not function and none of which is a monopoly of the young. There are more people in the workforce who are over 55 years than there are under 25. As well, those over 55 contribute the staggering sum of 74.5 billion a year through caring for spouses, grandchildren, and in other unpaid voluntary work. In 2011, there were nearly a million children receiving childcare on a regular weekly basis from a grandparent. The trend is already for people to stay and work longer. People want to work, and not just for economic reasons. Work gives them purpose and social involvement. So if the assumptions about productivity are wrong, what about the assumption we're going to crash the health system? Old age is not a disease. The evidence for an impending disaster is spurious. The health system, those who run it, and the pharmaceutical companies have much to answer for in propounding this myth. Misdiagnosis and overdiagnosis is rife in the medical system. It's important not to allow medical treatment to get in the way of your good health. There are many ways the system can become more cost effective. We're not very good about talking about death. I'm not afraid of dying, said Woody Allen, but I don't want to be around when it happens. <laughs> and in the absence of talk, millions of dollars are wasted on futile aggressive medical interventions for patients who are unable to speak for themselves, whose death is inevitable. Advanced care planning would save 250 million annually. The Grattan Institute has argued that the government could save 1.3 billion each year by reforming the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. Applying the new science of pharmacogenomics of prescribing drugs based on an individual's biomarkers, which can be examined through a simple blood test, would save the health system 12 billion over five years. The use of improved anaesthetics and improved cataract surgery have already helped reduce the duration of hospital stays. And doctors are calling for new surgical techniques to be subjected to the same level of scrutiny as new drugs. Expert panels with disclosed financial relationships to drug companies are widening the boundaries for diseases like blood pressure, osteoporosis, attention deficit disorder, asthma and a high cholesterol. The growing diagnosis of so-called depression is another case in point. As a result of these expert panels, doctors are over-diagnosing and treating more and more people with low risk of the diseases, but adding significantly to the costs in the medical system. Then there is the disease that we fear more than death, Alzheimer's, which is not a consequence of normal ageing. Pharmaceutical solutions have so far been unsuccessful. Social isolation is believed to exacerbate all forms of dementia. And researchers now believe the single most important thing anyone can do to stall dementia is to exercise the brain and 
develop cognitive reserves. And how do you do this? By brain exercise. Not just by doing the daily crossword, but in continuing meaningful education, enjoyable work, pleasurable leisure activities, physical exercise, social interaction, learning new skills like a new language or computer skills. And doing this across our lifetime. There's a new show coming on the ABC next week with Todd Simpson who's, uh, from the advertising show where he's testing his brain power. It so it looks interesting and worth looking at, but it's about this principle of brain exercise. Because the brain needs to be active and stimulated in ways that are always new. The brain is inquisitive by design. It is constantly and productively self-exploratory. And what confounds the brain enlivens the brain. So if we implemented what we already know, there would be massive savings to the health system. The budget deficit we hear so much about could be reduced by billions. And as the older, the fastest growing demographic in our society, what needs to be done? The media has an important role to play in changing the perceptions of ageing. Generally, on commercial media, people are depicted according to their relative importance in the market. The young who spend most fill the screens in news, entertainment and fiction. And just as black people were absent from television before the civil rights movement in America, and Australian children were absent before program regulation, the group with least exposure in the media today are the aged. Ageism is the new racism. In a society that glorifies youth, as ours does, we do all we can to deny the ageing process. The market trades on our vulnerability with the promotion of body industries worth billions to the economy. But no matter how much we invest in treatments, it's 100% certain if we dodge the traffic, old age will take hold of us. And when it does, it comes as a surprise. We catch an unexpected view of ourselves in a passing window and we think, oh my God, that <laughs> cannot be me. <laughs> we react because we know we don't fit the image that society reveres. So the dominant images need to change. And it can happen. When I first started teaching media courses back in the 70s, we regularly had bare-breasted girls on page three of the Sun, you will recall, or the tabloid press generally. And feminists brought about change. You don't see that now in the main papers. And elders will do the same with their image. The distinguished political economist Robert Reich sees ageing, this is the way he described it, as a far bigger threat to the world economy than the Eurozone debt crisis, US unemployment and the Chinese slowdown combined. A problem unfolding, he says, like a slow motion train wreck. Now, if this happened, this is from a man who's active and 67, um, it would be because there is a collective failure to understand ageing and change policies that could transform us. We ageing Australians are not going to take this neglect without action. My book, In Praise of Ageing and the Elders Whose Lives I Describe, is a challenge to the negative propaganda and short-sighted thinking that we experience. We are a resilient bunch, and our lives could easily be very much improved. While about 30% of one's likelihood of living to 100 is determined by genes, 
and longevity does run in families. Attitude is just as important in determining whether we will live a long life. My argument assumes we accept the responsibility for looking after ourselves to the best of our ability, physically and mentally, that we make an effort to reinvent ourselves, our work and purpose as circumstances change over a long life. Most centenarians alive today live independently, not in aged care homes. In turn, as individuals, we have a right to be given respect, given access to work opportunities, both paid and unpaid, and good medical support. The language used to talk about us, our cultural attitudes and media reporting should not be allowed to create and amplify social problems for those living the second half of their lives. Portrayals of the age as a burden just do not help. The elders I've written about in Praise of Aging are striking examples of living well and successfully in their advancing years. They demonstrate how it is done. It's time to praise ageing not to bemoan a natural stage of our lives and an achievement that should be celebrated. Thank you.